most requested talk, and I'm really excited to bring you Ari Higgy to talk about closure and machine learning with Flair. Ari. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that warm welcome. Cool. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about um, I'm going to talk about Flare just to give me a sense of of, of uh, context here. How many people here have like used a neural net library before, TensorFlow or PyTorch or Cafe2? Okay. Let me ask you other. How many people have not used it? Okay. Cool. All right. Perfect. So that's that's uh, optimally high entropy. Um, <laughs> so let me ask a question that you may be asking yourself: Why the heck do we need another neural net library? And and I'm not 100% sure there's a good answer to that. Um, but I'll tell you my reasoning. Um, one of them is, is, is uh, there, there are two kinds of neural net libraries. We kind of bucket them all together. There's ones that are static and there are ones that are dynamic. So TensorFlow um, is, up until very recently, a very static uh, neural net library. Um, uh, PyTorch is the biggest dynamic one, although the lines are starting to blur with some of the recent things that TensorFlow has been doing. Um, so in, in my opinion, and this is just a complete opinion, of the dynamic neural nets, which are really crucial for a lot of stuff in NLP, which is what I do, what I've done most of my life and what my kind of hobby projects are in, um, you really need dynamic neural nets for a variety of reasons. Static neural nets work really well in, in, in vision where you have like a fixed size image, um, but for anything involving language or parsing or anything where the kind of there's dynamic structure, you need dynamic neural nets. And of the dynamic neural nets, in my opinion, PyTorch is the only really usable one. Um, it's, it's, got a, it's got a clean API. Um, the problem is it's in Python. Um, and <laughs> um, it's in Python, it's got some weird issues and it just doesn't have the same expressiveness. So like a lot of people who, who've done a lot of stuff in Clojure, um, when I've done stuff in ML, I've had to jump into PyTorch and TensorFlow and I just haven't enjoyed it as much. And so um, I wanted to actually make something and just to show that you can do efficient ML it, even in the neural net world in, uh, on the JVM and it works perfectly fine and in fact it's actually faster than PyTorch as we'll see. Um, it doesn't have all the bells and whistles but um, just wanted to prove that this was all feasible. Um, in general, uh, it's, uh, I think Clojure is a good choice for, for data science. It's unfortunate the world kind of doesn't necessarily agree with that. Um, I think like, you know, if you look at the ascendancy of Python in the last two years, a good part of it is just a package of libraries and stuff that the Clojure community just hasn't put together. And so um, I'll actually talk about one um, beyond Flare. I'll do one slide at the end. I wrote something called Koala, which is like pandas um, in Clojure. Um, the nice thing about this implementation, if nothing else, is I actually think you can read the whole thing. It's under 3,000 lines of code. Um, and so it's still in a state where you can like understand everything going on. Okay, um, so here's the part that might be boring if you've actually used neural nets before. Um, what we call like a neural net library is kind of completely misnamed. Um, what they really are are computation graphs, right? So TensorFlow and PyTorch and all of these things basically do the exact same thing. Um, you basically declare a computation and that computation gets uh, represented as a graph. Um, there's a graph structure there and I'll talk about why there's a graph structure in a second. But in a very simple example, um, here you declare a variable x with some value, which is, a, which is an array in this example. We'll talk about tensors on the next slide. And then you have all these operators. So all the normal math operators that you think about are really, are really things that create little trees, right? So if you want to do add two variables together, it makes a little tree, and then you get a z. So if you've done anything with um, uh, abstract syntax trees, it's very similar. You're basically representing the entire history of a computation, and there's a data structure associated for that. Um, and so all of you know, TensorFlow and, and PyTorch and Flare all do the same exact thing in this regard. Um, so here's actually like a real example. So um, you might ask yourself like how does this actually work? So if you ever bust open an archive or uh, an ML paper um, that, that does anything with neural nets, you'll often see these crazy diagrams. Um, and these diagrams actually make the graph structure really, really apparent. Um, it's not expected that you understand this entire thing. <laughs> um, I'll actually come back to this and we'll walk through this example, but um, you can get a sense that this is actually, you know, for those of you who have done a lot of stuff with neural nets before, um, what this is doing is pretty standard. It's taking, it's taking a little n-gram, so three words in a row. There's embeddings for each word. It's finding all the embeddings. It's concatenating them into a big embedding. It's doing a bunch of matrix operations and tangents and another uh, matrix operation of softmax and then it's making some kind of prediction, right? So this is a model that would take uh, a sliding n-gram window and make a prediction about each n-gram. For instance, it could be predicting what the next word would be. Okay, and so um, this is obviously a graph under the hood and so all these libraries basically do the same thing. Okay, 
Um, I'm not actually sure what happened in the picture there, but that's fine. Um, the, a dynamic neural net means that this graph structure isn't fixed ahead of time. So um, uh, what that means, for instance, is sometimes if you wanted to classify four words instead of three words in this example, um, sometimes you have more words that you want to deal with than fewer words. And TensorFlow, at least in its most normal state, you have to fix the graph and you basically train everything against a fixed graph. Um, and so what happens in practice is you end up, if you have like a longer sentence or a shorter sentence, what happens in NLP if you use TensorFlow, is you end up padding with a bunch of zeros. So if you've ever written a bunch of TensorFlow code to do something, you probably have um, run into a situation where you end up padding stuff because you basically get one fixed graph. And the reason it does that is because all the Python is doing is it's constructing the graph and then it's immediately C code basically by the time you actually execute anything against it. And that's for efficiency. Um, so, but there's a lot of problems that you actually can't do this way, where you need to actually dynamically, depending on your input, change the graph structure. Um, this word tensor, I think, was a huge mistake. I'm not actually sure why we ended up using it um, in, this, in this world, because um, it's, it's not even technically mathematically correct. But um, a tensor basically, and you hear this phrase a lot, it's basically just a multidimensional array of numbers. Um, and so the big trick in Flare um, is that uh, you can implement you can implement like multi-dimensional arrays in Java um, if you care about performance you won't do that uh, but you can um, you can do nested JVM arrays um, the what uh, what PyTorch uses is it actually uses a library called uh, Neanderthal which uses native uh, basically native off off heap buffers um, and so uh, that's actually how you get a lot of performance is um, the, the, it's using something called Intel uh, MPK, or not MPK, sorry, Math Kernel Library, MKL, um, uh, under the hood to do all the math. So all of the math that's actually happening in Flare is basically native C++ math on top of non-heat man managed memory. So there's no, one of the arguments for Python and numerical computing has been that for something like NumPy or for TensorFlow, um, that you were doing C++ math and you, you were you know, down to the kernel and you can actually get that in the JVM now and you have since JVM 8 at least um, and that's actually only getting better. Um, lastly, I haven't actually done this yet but you can also, uh, you can also represent a tensor with a, a GPU buffer um, and so that's, it's actually pretty straightforward to take everything in Flare and make it run on a GPU. I personally haven't because for the vast majority of like real world use cases you don't use GPUs. Like GPUs are usually for training you, nobody really uses GPUs for inference, so when you actually use a machine learning model in practice, it's not like Facebook or Google has a fleet of GPU machines like running, executing stuff. Um, cool, any questions? Uh, so let me try to take a question or two here uh, in case anything is already confusing. On the last note, yeah. you, said, you said that you don't actually use GPUs. And does the GPU make it run faster and it's just so irrelevant that you don't care about that extra speed or does it not apply to something other than the initial uh, model, uh, models that you're building. Yeah, so, so GPUs are just an alternative way. So um, uh, Flare has an abstraction for how the computation happens. It has like a tensor engine abstraction. And so GPUs are just a different way. If you, instead of doing a multiplication um, against kind of the uh, low level Intel CPU instruction sets, you can do them on GPU buffers. Um, and so the only reason I haven't implemented it yet, honestly, is because like outside of work, I don't actually have access to GPUs. So, <laughs> you know, this, despite the fact that I, you know, I, I have a lot of access to GPUs at work for this kind of stuff, I generally don't, you know, we're not executing a lot of closure code inside of Facebook. So, um, uh, yeah, so for me personally on this laptop or on EC2 machines, I'm, I'm just on CPUs. To be honest, for a lot of NLP stuff, it's, it's a lot less crucial. Like I think for vision, it makes a lot of sense. Like, three-dimensional convolutional operations happen very well on the GPU. Matrix multiplications do as well, but the gap is smaller. And, and like I said, almost no one really uses GPUs for inference. Like, that's primarily a training thing. Um, anything else? Our experience with GPUs give you an advantage, but not to offset the cost. It's like you end up paying more even though it goes faster. So yeah, I mean, I think the big problem is GPUs, like, create, the mental model's bad, right? Like, so, uh, the, the problem with the GPU is, like, once you, you it, there's expensive to move stuff into a GPU and move stuff out of a GPU. And so, a lot of the complexity in TensorFlow comes from, basically, people having to manually move back and forth be between devices, and I think it's a little harder to read. If I did GPU stuff, I'd want to think about how to make it smart and not have to, like, tell, not explicitly have to tell and move stuff between devices. Uh, but that's probably future work. Okay, um, so uh, basically what happens with computation graphs is 
the reason why you do the computation graph is so um, you can ultimately do learning on top of these graphs. Um, and so there's this thing called forward and backward propagation. You've probably heard those terms before. Um, all of forward propagation is, um, is that you build a graph of nodes and the structure of these graphs is immutable. It's all in closure. I'll show you what the data structures look like in just a minute. Um, and basically the root of that tree, so I'm saying root, but it's whatever the, the topmost value is, right? The root of that tree contains the value for the entire computation, like in this example with Z. Um, so uh, the, the trick is the structure is an immutable closure data structure, as you'll see in a moment, um, but the values are actual mutable buffers, right? So there, there is a little bit of that dirtiness that you need for efficiency. Um, and so basically just doing that computation up the tree is what's normally known as the forward pass, right? So that's just a complicated way of saying you represented a computation as a graph, and so now you actually execute that computation bottom up, and that's a forward pass. Um, and so here's actually, let me actually now show you some actual Flare. Um, so the way that Flare works is you have to call this Flare init, and that's mostly because um, there's a lot of native libraries you have to load up to use Intel MP MKL. And then um, that example I just showed you, you define a node with a, with a, with a little vector, um, and then you define the, the plus operation. You can choose to import those math operations if you want, and then you can ask for the value of that node and you get the tensor. Um, and so if, you, if you're used to um, TensorFlow, this is not what happens, right? You have to like execute the session, you have to do all this stuff. They're trying to change that now, but by default all the computation is eager. So um, all the computation happens as soon as you create the graph node. Um, Cool. Okay, so that's what a flare actually looks like for a simple thing. Um, so now let's talk about the backward pass. So the reason why you keep this tree structure, all this entire structure in place, the reason why you keep the history of the computation is because generally when you do learning, you need to be able to compute the gradient, um, like the derivative of uh, the, the uh, function that you're computing. You need to compute the derivative of it with respect to the parameter node. So I haven't talked about parameters yet, but some of these nodes are um, inputs that you provide, like this is the embedding for a word, and some of them are actually parameters, right? And I haven't made that distinction yet, but I, I will in a moment here. Um, and so basically, uh, the way that you do uh, compute a gradient uh, for all these things is you have the history of the computation, and you basically execute what's known as the chain rule backwards down the tree. So the backward pass basically says, at the very top, I tell you, go compute all the gradients, and then you go back down the tree, and as you go down the tree, you compute the gradients at every node. I'm not gonna dwell on the math examples, like I can't pack like years of kind of ML experience into a 30 minute talk, but, but basically the, what's going on under the hood is you've built a tree, um, and now you need to do a computation down to the leaves. All of the parameters are leaves of this computation graph. Um, and you basically uh, go back down in um, and, uh, and update gradients as you go. And then at the very end, when you've updated all your gradients, you, you use those gradient changes to like update the parameter values and you do that over and over again and that's basically how machine learning works now. Uh, any questions? Yeah, I mean, it's probably too high level to ask questions about how. Uh, <laughs> So cool, so now, um, now I'm gonna walk a little bit through nodes, because this is a closure talk after all. So I'll talk a little bit about how this works in closure. Um, so uh, this is like, again, that simple graph example. Notice that I've changed, I've, instead of using another variable, I'm using W to represent the, uh, the parameter node. So um, the, this keyword here represents a type of nodes, and there's three types of nodes that you can have in a computation graph. Um, you can have um, the output of an operation, which is most of the nodes in a graph, or most of the nodes of the graph are non-leafs, um, and they all are called op because they are the result of some kind of tensor operation that happens on top of things. Um, and there's two kind of leaf nodes. There is what's a, called a constant. A constant is an input. It's something you provide. So if you want to do some, build a model on top of the fixed embeddings of a word, those fixed embeddings are, are inputs. Um, or if you have a vector that comes in, like a feature vector from somewhere, that's considered an input. It's not something that the graph itself is modeling or executing on. And then there's parameters. Parameters are, um, are also leaves. They have to be leaves if you think about it. Um, and so uh, these are actually shared, referen um, shared values across, um, across different parts of a computation graph, right? So um, you can have parameters show up in lots of different places. Um, and here's the dirty part is the gradient. So 
one of the rules about a parameter is that you can only have one version with that same name. So that if you have, if you have like a parameter show up in two different places in the graph and you execute a gradient update, you need to accumulate all the updates to the single parameter. Um, so like this is actually all a node is, right? So this is, this is, you know, this is just the closure version of that. There's some extra, this is just to give you a sense of like, it's, there's no more magic or craziness to it. It is just as simple as that. Um, so uh, there's some extra fields in there. Like you need to know what the shape of the node is, meaning is this a two dimensional vector, or like a matrix, or is it a single dimensional one? Is it a five length vector, a 10 length vector, et cetera? So the shape is available on everything. If you've ever written a lot of TensorFlow or, or PyTorch before, shape management is one of the hardest things to get right. <laughs> Um, and so you can actually have a macro that checks all your shapes are, are consistent, which is really useful. Um, okay, um, what's a model? Um, so in, in, in Flare, a model is just a collection of parameter nodes. It's just a mapping between the name of a parameter and this canonical node that you can use in your model. Um, so uh, the parameter nodes themselves have gradients and they're updated after um, a mini batch example. And there's a little code that shows you how they work. You make a model, that model is going to house all the parameters that you're going to have. Um, you can say, hey, model, give me some more parameters. In this case, a two by two matrix, give it a name. The name is there so that you can print out the computation later and see what everything looks like. There is a macro that will automatically name the parameter according to whatever the let binding is. Right, so that's one of the nice, like if you've ever written a lot of PyTorch code or, or TensorFlow, you end up saying my variable is called W and it also has the name W because Python doesn't have like macros. Um, and so you can actually do that here. I just opted not to, to, to avoid introducing stuff, but you can have a special let scope that will magically name all the variables what the let binding has. What's more, it'll actually automatically do nesting. So if you have like one piece of thing inside of another piece of thing, it'll actually nest the names, which is again something if you've ever written a lot of PyTorch code is kind of a pain in the ass. Um, okay, let me get through this one and then I'll do some questions. Um, I think, is that big enough for people to see? That was my, was my one concern. Um, so a module is basically, um, so modules are, are, are this idea that is somewhat similar for a lot of neural net libraries. It's done a little differently in Flare. Um, so in Flare, basically what you say is, I need an abstraction for how do you give me a bunch of inputs, whatever the inputs are, and um, I can produce, um, I can produce basically a piece of a graph for you, right? Um, typically, what happens is when you have a module, it will it will have a let over lambda style structure where um, you you're going to close over parameters that you create. So um, I've got an example here that's really common. Probably one of the more common examples of a of a of a neural net module is affine. Affine basically is the linear algebra version of a linear function. Um, all it means is you give me a single input, I multiply it by a matrix W, and I add a constant bias B, right? So it's just a linear, let's like your old uh, Y equals MX plus B from algebra one, basically. It's the linear algebra version of that. Um, so um, this is actually all the code there is for, for setting that up. Um, there's some, most of this code is actually about initializing the parameters randomly, which is just a thing that you want to do. So you normally can't initialize parameters to zero because most neural nets have like saddle points. Um, so uh, most of that code is actually initialization, but that's actually all the code there is. And then at the end, you have this little reify at the bottom, and that reify basically says, I know how to make a graph. If you give me an input x, then I'm going to take that input x, and I'm going to uh, return basically the output of that affine thing. And the model that you provide me is going to get some magical parameters added to it. And what's more, um, Whenever you make this affine thing, you'll magically get nesting. So if you name this affine module, then your parameter weight will be called affine module slash w or whatever. So all this like name management stuff that's kind of a pain in the ass is actually taking care of you automatically. Okay, any questions? No, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'm actually going to do something. This might be really, for some reason, I thought there'd be a bigger screen. It'd be easier to show people. But um, I'm going to try this. How many people can actually read the words on the right-hand side? Just quick show of hands. No one can. Uh, I'm not sure I'm actually making any better. Let me just make this picture bigger, and we'll go over the picture. 
Cool. Okay. How many people can read that now? Okay. Cool. So um, believe it or not, what this is actually doing is this little piece of code is doing that big graph over there. Okay. So um, just to show you what that graph is doing. So actually, maybe I'll just walk through it. So that graph has like two affine modules so that you make one affine module uh, for some parameters, another affine module. And then what happens is uh, you provide a model in an embedding. You take all the words in your little n-gram window and then you map an embedding lookup over them. This operation takes the string word and then it basically replaces, it says here's like a constant node which represents the embedding for that word. Okay, so that in, in uh, this is gonna get really annoying but I guess it's probably easier to do it this way. So let's, let's actually walk through this graph because I've got, I'll, I'll do this first. So, um, okay, can people see that now? Okay, so what happens in this graph is you have like a bunch of words, there's a lookup operation that happens, and that lookup operation puts a 50 dimensional vector on each of those things, right? And so then what happens is you concatenate all those vectors, and so now you have 150 dimensional vectors, three times 50, um, which represents kind of, this is a vector representation of the entire n-gram window. So that's the concat. And then what happens is you multiply that by w, and then you're going to add the b. Right, so that's an affine operation, right? So there's, there's one affine operation with these two parameters, and then you have this step here. You run it through a uh, hyperbolic tangent. So if you don't know what that is, it's basically um, you apply a function to every element inside of that tensor, um, and then you multiply by this and you add that, so that's another affine module. So you basically take two affines, you take an affine, you have like an affine sandwich. You have an affine, and then you have like the tangent, and then you have an affine, and then let's ignore the rest for now. So let's go back to the code, because I think you can actually put most of those pieces together now. Um, okay, so um, here I've made the two affine modules. So again, usually a module is a let over a lambda. Um, so you make those two, and then now you have your words, you look up vector, your, your tensors for each word, and then you concatenate them. So that apply concatenate will basically concatenate all of them along the zeroth dimension, which basically means just stack them, stack them horizontally. Okay? And so now you've got one big, uh, you've got a node which represents the, the concatenation of the embeddings. Uh, and then you take that and you run it through affine, the first affine module, then you run it through tangent, uh, hyperbolic tangent, and then you run it through another affine module, and that, that takes you to basically right below the pick. And then there's some stuff here, so that's actually the score, right? So once you run it through that, you basically have the scores for all of the possibilities, and then there's some magical code down here that basically says, give me the, oh, by the way, if you give me the label, I also know how to give you the loss for how well you're predicting against, uh, your, how well you're predicting against that label, okay? Any questions about this? Like, like I, my hope is that people would get this, but I was also hoping for a larger screen as well. Yeah. So, so does this graph represent how you're going to set up your training, or just for inference? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So the the single arity is used for inference. The sec the two arity is used for training. So basically, the way that I handle like this is a really common pattern, and it it blows my mind that none of the other libraries have figured this out. You want a module and you want to keep your code together that normally you have like a, a model and you want to have, this is the part of the model where I can ask for the predictions. This is the part of the model where I actually need to compute the loss. And, and you want those in one place. And for the life of me, like, I don't know why PyTorch tensor, I haven't figured this out yet. Um, and so there's a really easy answer. It's that, well, basically I'm going to provide multiple arities of a function, right? So if you call this, if you call my module with one arity, I'm going to just do predictions. If you give me two things, I'm going to assume the second thing is a label and that you're going to, you're going to want the loss. And, and that's because the key module is returning a function and has two arities? No, no, no. It, it, I'm, I'm calling it a function, but it's really just a, for, for reasons I won't get into that have to do with like adding metadata. Um, for other things you don't need to worry about in the implementation. Um, I, I, I'm calling it a function, but it's really, it's really a protocol with, a, it's a really a protocol with like a multiple arities uh, for this function, yeah. So graph is basically the, the one marker kind of function in the protocol that has multiple arities. And it's just calling it that so it's clear that you're saying, I'm making a graph by taking these inputs. Any questions? Other questions? I want to, I want to clarify that the they call that the affine functions are called at the top. Yeah, they're outside of the they're outside of this because the parameters behind this persist between executions of this function. Right. So yeah, you call the the return the result of this is something you call on all the examples. 
And so you want to accumulate gradients across the entire batch. Yeah. But that by the functions themselves are something that you showed on the previous slide, it's something that the youth, that the consumer of the library defines for themselves. Well, I defined it, I was nice enough to do it for you, but yes, you could define, it could be a self-defined thing. Like if you defined your own little, basically a module is something which you, is a, is, doesn't, so there's, there's tensor operations, which are things where you need to get low level, and there's basically composing a bunch of those pieces together in a module. And so some of the basic modules, like softmax, or all the things that you can implement yourself given tensor operations, the user can do themselves. The ones that involve tensor operations are like lower level, like matrix multiplication. You can't define matrix multiplications in terms of atomic, other atomic things. You have to basically define that gradient for yourself. So there's like some distinction between things that basically I expect the average person who uses this to do and then things I expect an expert to do. And the experts are like manipulating the, the native buffer and things like that. I don't expect the average person to do that. The average person who uses this will define functions that look like affine, where they basically are defining their own Lego like co composition of Lego blocks. Okay, um, so now I'll go through an even more complicated example. This may be completely inappropriate for the audience, given like half of people feel, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. So I wanted to actually show you how like you implement like bigger stuff and how like like if you actually dive into PyTorch and I've done this and look at how um, LSTMs are implemented, it's horrifying. It's 500 lines of trying to be really efficient because every time you create an object in Python, you just get fucked. Um, and, and you don't have to worry about that as much in the JVM because like that's actually, I'll, we'll get to this when I talk about performance. The reason why Flare is so much faster is because you end up spending a lot of time creating graphs and in Python you have a fundamental limit. Every time you call allocate and you run into kind of gill, you just get hosed and, and you can do a good job of that on the JVM. So that's the whole reason why it's faster. Um, so, so LSTMs, you don't need to learn this here. It's, you know, it takes a long time to get and they're not even necessarily intuitive, but um, I'll show you at a high level, LSTMs are basically um, ways to take sequential data and learn long-term patterns over them. Um, this graph, so oftentimes people do this trick where usually you have a bunch of inputs, each of those inputs has like their own little embedding, and then you run it through an LSTM forward, you run it through an LSTM backwards, and then you concatenate those representations, and those representations encode useful stuff. Uh, in this particular example, you're just taking the last one, which represents like, I've looked at the entire sentence and I've remembered what the hell I want to remember and now I'm going to go and answer some question. Um, and so like for instance if you're classifying a sentence this is like a common thing. Um, so uh, can people read the closure code there? Okay, yeah. Um, and so uh, LSTMs are an instance of what's called an RNN. An RNN is basically um, anytime you have, uh, it's more general than sequential data, but for the purposes of this code abstraction, it's sequential data. So basically you define, there's a protocol for a cell, um, and so other kinds of RNN cells are things called GRUs and quasi-RNNs and LSTMs. There's a couple different types of like ways of defining sequential stuff. So that's why there's a protocol behind it. Um, the details aren't that important, but there's a little abstraction there for you. Um, Okay, way more math than we probably need, but this is to give you a sense of how complex the math is. So basically, uh, I'll try to explain this really quickly, but um, you don't need to follow the details, but just like there's a lot of steps in this graph, right? So there's um, basically what happens is you have a single input and you have a previous, uh, a previous hidden state, and both of these are, are vectors of a certain length. Um, and then what happens is you basically, you basically get four, you wanna basically do four different affine operations you want to do four different affine operations that do different things, right? So one of them is called this F for forget. So basically it's the set of things you want to remove and subtract off the vector. So the way LSTMs work is they basically memorize what they think they need in order to like do a good job on the task. So there's, a, there's something that forgets. There's something that like, oh, here's the things I want to remember. Here's the things that I want to keep from this current input. Um, and here's some magical cell state that I want to preserve between stuff. So you do a bunch of affine stuff, you, you run this little sigma here, means you run a sigmoid over the output, this one's a hyperbolic tangent, um, this little star is what's called element-wise product, so it's basically, I take two vectors, I'm not multiplying them together, I'm doing a pair uh, element-wise product, or sometimes called a Hadamard product. Um, and then basically I'm doing a whole bunch of math operations, and then I'm spitting out a hidden state, and some cell state that is that remains inside of the, the function. So you don't need to learn all of that, but it's basically like just to give you a sense of the complexity. I, I actually think the code is not so bad. Um, so uh, I'll try to walk through it really quickly. I, I mean, I guess I'm saying it's not that bad, but I think compared to the actual math, I think it's like pretty simple. So um, basically, what you do is you, as usual with a module, you have a let over a lambda, basically. Um, in this case, a reify. 
Um, and so uh, you basically, what you do, the trick to this math is you realize, um, and this is kind of funny, um, if you'll notice that all of these things together, you're adding them together, it's actually the same mathematically if you just concatenate all the, um, there's basically two multiplication parameters here, and you basically concatenate the input with the previous hidden input, and then instead of doing four different affine operations, just do one big affine operation, right? So that's how you minimize the number of, of uh, matrix multiplications. So basically I stack all of those four things together and do one big affine operation, right? And so this one affine operation, once it's all in this buffer, you've, you've isolated the code down to like, there's this one place where it's gonna run Loblaw's la, like, like nobody's business, but it's all in one place. Um, so you basically define a, 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 an affine module that takes this, does that one big multiplication. And so once you've done that one big multiplication, you use a lot of the, the flare operators. So one thing you can do is split. So you can take a tensor and split it. So I take the output of that big thing and I split it into four pieces, basically. Or actually three piece, uh, two pieces. Um, if you go back and notice, there's more structure to be preserved because I'm doing four big multiplication here, but three of them are sigmoids. Three of the outputs have sigmoids on them and one of them is a hyperbolic tangent. So lest we not drop any efficiency, um, <laughs> we, we basically split this into Three of those operations go into IOF for input, output, and forget, and one of them goes into state. Um, and then for each of the different uh, ones that get the sigmoid, I basically do a split. I take a sigmoid of the entire thing, so I'm only doing one sigmoid pass over one big vector, and then I split it up into the different dimensions. So this is to minimize copying back and forth, right? So every time you split or concatenate, you're copying uh, native buffers. Um, and so then you get all those things and then I run all the Hadamard and this part's a little more complicated down here but then you get the whole thing and that's actually it, right? This is, this is 500 to 1,000 lines of Python and this is way, way faster. And a lot of it is just the, a lot of it honestly is just that it's not expensive to make the nodes. You, you want to just be able to minimize the number of math operations you're doing um, is most of it. Um, okay, and so then, um, so now I'm going to show you the sentence classifier. Okay, let me, I think this is understandable. So forget, if you didn't understand LSTMs, that's fine. I think this bit might be understandable. So basically what you want to do here is you want to basically take a sentence. So um, again, I'm going to do this thing again where there's one arity which says give me a sentence and let me give you my predictions for, in this case, the sentiment of the sentence. There's another arity which says give me the loss function for the sentence and the label. So let's focus on this part. Um, so what I want is I need to first define an LSTM cell, which is a function you just saw. So this is the little bit that knows how to like give me output hidden states. Um, and then I have one affine function basically. After I do the LSTM, I want one affine at the top to project it down to two states so I have scores for my two labels. Um, and then what happens here is I take my sentence. My sentence is literally a sequence of string tokens. I, I, basic, I have a function that just basically will give you the uh, uh, the embeddings for each of those terms. I have a when let here because for some reason you can have an empty sentence in this data. Um, then there's a nice function that gives you a sequence of all the hidden states. So um, what that is, is that's actually this concat, right? So that's, that's like, that's the output of this is concatenation. Under the hood, I'm basically doing some bidirectional stuff that's not that important. Um, so, uh, and then I do all that, there's this dropout function, I'm not gonna talk about dropout, you, and then you basically run the last hidden to logits. Logits is just a term for the scores for the various classes, the log scores, and that's it. And then you, know, you have your normal thing where you say, give me the scores, give me a label, and let me give you the loss for my predictions in the label. And that's, that's it, that's the entire thing. Um, it's a little complicated, I mean, I, I, if, you don't, if you haven't done neural net stuff, my hope is that like the size of the function gives you some indication that it's like it's actually relatively straightforward and if you've written PyTorch or TensorFlow it should be understandable assuming you understand closure. I realize that intersection is not super huge but uh, it, it, <laughs> um, it's, it's still worth thinking about. Okay, so um, I'll give you some results. So ignore the absolute numbers since this isn't really that hard of a task, right? So like it's like it's sentiment classification in movie reviews which is pretty easy. Um, so uh, the important part is the is the is the is the score. I'm actually pretty sure there's a bug somewhere in in in, uh, in like a numerical bug in PyTorch at the when you get close to like a low loss, which is part of why the training and test accuracies are different. Um, so uh, so Flare is more or less about three and a half times faster. The number is actually four and a half now. 
So there were there were some updates. Actually, I think it was J, JVM nine or one of the JVM updates actually did a much better job at uh, um, uh, at the native. The native buffers have gotten much much faster. Um, so like your the, the problem with Java and numerical stuff has usually been that you pay a you pay a, like a, a cost for going to native bridge. Right, so one of the things that used to be true is if you're like, I want to do a bunch of like C++ stuff in Java, you're, you're basically paying to take stuff between uh, heap managed memory and off heap memory. Um, and so the barriers to using off heap memory have just decreased a lot. And so you, you, things have gotten better. Um, so it's about three and a half to four times faster for this example. And this is actually a pretty complicated example. Um, uh, you can, this is also on one CPU. So the other thing we didn't talk about is PyTorch has this other problem, which is this little thing called the gill. Um, you've probably heard about that's responsible for some of this. So you can actually parallelize. So we didn't talk about this, but you can actually par you can trivially parallelize Flare, whereas like try you know doing that in in Python you end up having to copy a lot of state, um, and so the overhead is also lower for multi CPU, right? So that's one of the other nice things about using the JVM is you get Java util concurrent, um, and you can use that. And there's um, uh, the only tricky part is you you need to do synchronization around gradients, but that's that's a that's, that's pretty minor. You don't have to copy data, which is usually what will happen if you try to use subprocess or something in Python. Okay, um, any questions about that? I'm gonna do one more slide on something else. How does it compare to Google's TensorFlow library? Is that, is that um, something that PyTorch consumes? I'm not very familiar with that. It is, uh, no, PyTorch is totally separate. So PyTorch is based on Chainer, which is this like offshoot of, uh, it has a co its own complicated history. Um, no, they're not comparable, right? So if you, so the answer to your question depends a lot on, um, there's no way to basically do, so this part here where the size of the sequence depends on the input, there's no way to do that. Okay. So in order to do that in TensorFlow, you have to pick a maximum length and buffer. And so depending on how that the variance is from the max to the average, so you're doing all the math operations anyway, it's just they're mostly wasted, it's all zeros, right? So like um, the answer is it can be much better if like all your sentences are of length five or it can be much, much worse. So, it, and the answer also depends on how much work you're willing to do. So for example, when I've used TensorFlow in the past, something, is, something I do is I, um, instead of making, so like let's say you're dealing with real sentences and real sentences have some distribution, like many of them are short, some of them are long, some of them are super long, and you need to handle all of them. So if you just make one thing and make it the maximum length sentence, you end up wasting most of your computation because you're very, like the max is far away from the average. Okay, so that will perform much more force than this, right? That will perform much more force. If you decide to do something smarter and spend a bunch of time, you can make a bunch of copies of your model for different lengths of buckets and round up to the nearest five. So you can say, this is my version of the model from length zero to five. It's the same parameters, it's just that you have to like make a different static graph. For the, this is called binning. It's so, it, like, think about how dumb it is. You have to have a name for this whole process of like, <laughs> it's called binning. Um, and if you bin, you can get faster depending again. Like if you basically are willing to sacrifice a lot of memory and say, I'm gonna have a fixed graph for every possible length of sentence. And so that anytime a sentence comes in, I look up my graph, I look up, you know, what is the what is the fixed static graph for that length and I execute against that graph. So that will be much more efficient because again, the graph is compiled. There's no Python object creation in TensorFlow at runtime, right? You basically take the NumPy array and then everything from there on out is basically effectively compiled C code. So I don't know if you know how TensorFlow works. TensorFlow basically like compiles little protocol buffers for you and then under the hood when you execute, like you do a, run, do a session dot run, it's not, there's no Python object creation that's going on under the hood. It's all C++. Yeah. You said some of this is built on top of Neanderthal. Mm -hmm. Um, my impression was that that library had its own neural net capabilities in there too. I might. That'd be news to me. Yeah, I mean, people. No, no, no. I think what's confusing is like people confuse like math with neural. So it has a lot of linear. Algorithms. It has like it has like uh, Cholesky decompositions. It has like basically a a version of almost everything in like a, like a, a Loblaw or whatever. But it doesn't do neural net. So it has like matrix multiplications and and like uh, and various things. But it's not doing computational graph stuff. Yeah. So speaking of blahs and whatnot, uh, you mentioned that there is a way to plug GPUs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Neanderthal actually has an abstraction for GPUs. So what is the, I haven't used it, what is the, what are the nuts and bolts of saying, hey, I've got, you know, a GeForce 1080 plugged in, how do I make it work? Yeah, so what you have to do basically is, um, you'd have to basically add, so the, so I have an implementation of this on a fork, it's not that nice, which is part of why I've like not released it, but um, you basically need an operation to basically say, move me from the CPU to the GPU, 
So you basically need an, and all that operation does under the hood is the forward pass of it basically just copy, you know, it basically takes the name of the GPU queue and, and just copies that it does like a, a CU, whatever the function is for copying stuff. And then for the gradient, it just copies back. So what, so you basically move stuff there. And, uh, and so you have to like explicitly be aware of where the computation is happening in the graph. But I find that a little annoying, um, uh, but that, that's basically it. You basically just say, move me to the GPU and then you have to move me out of the GPU. And then there's some other properties too. Like uh, once stuff is on the GPU, like you basically keep doing the computations there until you're done and then you pull stuff out. But every time you go back and forth, buses on GPUs are not very fast. Like GPUs, are the, it's like, you know, it's like, it's like the Hotel California, like things happen fast when you're there, but you, you can't really leave. It's hard to leave. It's very expensive. I don't actually understand why, but um, uh, yeah. And GPUs are also really expensive for like no, I mean, no good reason. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, they're also quite expensive. So that's the other reason too. Like when I've had to develop on, you know, I have one, but it's like a very old and crappy. Um, yeah. Does any of this, does the utility of this change at all with like TensorFlow Fold or whatever their more dynamic recent oh, oh, and, uh, their, and their Java API now. So, so the Java API is really just an API for, for making a graph. Um, so I don't think so. Like I, so to me, the reason why this works is because you get like closure expressiveness with it and you just don't, like you can't really get that. It's really hard to, like if you use, like there's been a, there's been a word to, or not word to fix, sorry, um, TensorFlow bridge to Scala for a long time. And it, it's, it's basically, it's basically that. I mean, I think it's better. I mean, I think TensorFlow eager is a, definitely a step up in terms of understandability. So I, I would actually go so far as to say, I don't understand how people start with TensorFlow because I find it really confusing to look at static stuff. Like this whole idea that you do a bunch of operations, but you have to like execute the graph before you see what happens. I find that really confusing. I don't know how people learn with it. So it's good that they did that. I think it was actually borderline necessary in order to like have more people. I mean, you know, Google's goal, right, is to like have as many people as possible use kind of like, you know, use this tool. And so going eager was a necessity. Um, I personally think it's, it's at the end of the day, it's still like Python code. It still works that way and everything. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one more thing. So I'll, I'll put a plug in for this. I was going to do more of this, but I actually didn't. So I, I also wrote something that, that I've been using a little bit for. Um, uh, it's called Koala. It's basically like a version of pandas. Who's familiar with pandas from like data frames and that? Okay, good. That, that I should have done that talk and stuff. Um, so basically, like, what is a what does a data frame look like in Closure? And so I, I thought a little bit about it, and the simplest answer I came up with is um, a data frame is basically uh, it looks like a table, right? And it's it's sequential over rows and it's associative on columns, which is really weird. And I'm pretty sure like Rich would be pissed off if he saw this because it actually violate like I think he has some like you know completely ridiculous rule about how these things should work. Um, he should have made a language that lets you do all this then. But uh, so <laughs> so so what I mean by that is you can read a CSV and so CSVs are rows and columns. Um, and then anytime you use a sequential function you're basically pretending like it's, 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 uh, you're, you're doing sequential over the rows. So this is like, I hate using, one of the reasons I hate using pandas is I can never tell, like, am I accessing a column? Am I accessing a row? If I do a for loop over it, what's gonna happen? Like, I, I find the model a little confusing. And so um, I, that's a simple rule is that if you do anything sequential, like take and first and all of those things or for loop or do seek, those are all going to be implicitly over the rows of the CSV and you're going to get um, basically pairs of the column values, right? And you can configure that, but basically you're sequential over the rows. Anytime you do something associative, like update in, associ, you're, you're doing it over the columns. And so it turns out that simple trick is actually all, all I actually needed my entire life in order to like manipulate these things. Um, like, like either whether it's SQL results or if it's, um, if it's a CSV or whatever. Um, so basically when you, uh, so as an example, um, here you make a little, you make a, uh, you make a data frame um, with this one has a single column and then you, you say, uh, take that, update that column and unit normalize it. And so you get negative one, zero and, and one. You can take it and basically uh, associate a new column with a function over the existing rows. You can associate a, like a constant value to it, et cetera. And so you, typically when you, when you use SQL call, when you use uh, associative stuff, what you're trying to do is define a new column, update a new column efficiently, et cetera. And so you can do all that but still like iterate over rows effectively. Has anyone tried to iterate over the rows of a, of a Python data frame before? It's pretty painful. Like I actually, I actually don't understand how it's so heavily used. I find it really, really confusing. Yeah. 
Uh, was there anything worth mining from Encanter, uh, which is like the, the project that kills me that has died, but... Um... <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, I think like everything about it that was good basically got ported out, I think. Like it had a lot of good things. I mean, for, I'll give you an example. Like um, I did some work on the Closure Jupyter plugin, and the question is, what should we do for graphs? And like Encanter was JFrame and you make a ping. Yeah, but it's like 2018, right? Like you can you can make like an HTML D3 thing and just hiccup spit it out and-, and I mean, In terms of the data frame implementation. I don't think so. I, I actually, I, I think it was, I think it was early closure. I, I won't say it was bad. I mean like, is it like half of the things that I'm using weren't around when, you know, weren't around when Cantor was created. But um, I, don't, I don't think so. I, I think like, um, uh, I, yeah, I, I found that model equally confusing as pandas. Um, Cool. Any questions about Koala? It's there now on GitHub. You can search for it. It's Closure Koala. It's ready to use. Anything else? Going back to the like, context in the beginning where you mentioned mm -hmm. the difference between static and dynamic, mm -hmm. is it reasonable to say that, that, that it ties into what you were talking about you know, with binning? The, the binning? Yeah. You know, that, that dynamic is the logical, or the logical, uh, that place that you arrive at after you take binning to its conclusion? Yeah, I mean, it's just a different execution model. So basically what it says is every time the, in a static uh, neural net, you get the input and you basically, the, the, the static graph, it's like I, I expect an input of uh, shape 50 by 30. So 50 dimensional rows, 30 dimensional columns, and that's what I expect. Dynamic basically says, oh, you gave me an input, let me build a graph for that. So I mean, like they're conceptually similar, but they're, they're just like different. You're just putting the burden of uh, graph construction uh, in, in the runtime. Anything else? Have you seen any segment adoption and hopes for the future? I, I mean, to be honest, I built it mostly for me. And I was hoping other people would do things. And you get a, I have a couple like pull requests for it. I think it'll take a while. Honestly, I think like I need to find time to like basically do a lot more with it. Um, I'm assuming until that happens, like if one of you wants to like work with it, that's great. That's fantastic. But I assume I have to like do more. Um, like I actually, I actually like if I have more time with closure, which is unlikely for the next like six months. Uh, but after that, at some point, like when I when I when I am spending more time doing like fun projects again, like I'll, I, I'll you know like I expect it needs like many more blog posts of people seeing cool stuff that you can do and and more comparisons and stuff. I, I I do expect like it's fundamentally limited to like the closure community. I wouldn't expect anyone to be like, oh, this is neural net stuff that I should learn. Let me go learn this other language to do it first. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, I expect people will still do Python for that, but. How would you do learning uh, ML and Clojure before you, you created this library? Would you like to oh my God. live through Interop <laughs> or write it all your own? Or? Um, it depends on what I'm doing. So like, I, I think if I was doing your own, I'd say you'd have to use PyTorch and then, and then like, I don't know what you do for inference. Uh, <laughs> Um, I mean, I guess in theory, Onyx. I mean, there was this thing called was a deep learning for J. I don't know if anyone's tried to use that or not. I, I think that's like a. I mean, it's it's really hard to use. I don't. I, yeah, it's a it's a hard model to use. Um, yeah, I don't I don't really know. If you're not doing neural nets, then like it doesn't make a difference. Like if you want to do logistic regression or or uh, grading piece of decision, all the normal things you can find in Java just fine. Um, and there's not a problem. There's plenty to wrap. But if you want to do neural nets, I find it really. I don't think there's like really a good solution out there. Um, uh, in particular, if you wanted to interop well with, uh, I mean, I guess maybe TensorFlow Java is your best choice. Um, cool. Anything else? All right. Thank you.